Imagine you're standing in a crowded restaurant. Suddenly it looks unsafe. Maybe you smell smoke, maybe there's a commotion. Now you probably would just bolt out first, right? That feels risky, too exposed. But what if you see this uh, really big, important looking guest, someone who definitely seems like they have better info than you, suddenly stand up and walk out? Your calculation changes instantly. You think, okay, if they're leaving, sums up, I should go too. Hmm. That one visible signal from a powerful entity, it just changes the game for everyone else. It kind of gives permission for coordinated action. So today we're doing a deep dive into a theoretical model that unpacks exactly this. How the observable action of what the model calls a large agent could be a foreign power, the military, maybe a huge bank depositor. How that action can trigger mass events. Think revolutions or financial crises. That's right. We're drawing on work that extends global game theory, which is really about how lots of people coordinate when things are uncertain, into the realm of social networks and, well, strategic risk. We're looking specifically at that interaction. One big visible player and a whole network of smaller players. Citizens, depositors, you name it. And our goal here is to get beyond the pure math. We want to understand these tipping points so we can think about, you know, better early warning systems, maybe building more resilient institutions against these kinds of shocks. Okay, let's get into the core idea then, this concept of a participation threshold. So you mentioned two main groups. Exactly. You've got the population of small agents, regular people, small savers. And then you have this powerful single player, the large agent, or lambda as the model terms it. And that large agent could be anyone really visible and influential, a foreign government maybe or even a big internal group like the military. Precisely, or a whale in the financial markets. The key is their action is observable. Now for the small agents, the crucial thing is their personal tipping point, their participation threshold. Okay, what does that mean exactly? It's the minimum confidence they need to act. So to join a protest or pull their money out of a bank, they need to believe there's a certain probability of success or that enough other people will join in. Right, otherwise it's too risky. You stick your neck out alone, you get punished. Exactly. If that threshold isn't met, they stay put. It's safer. But here's the fascinating part, the core insight from the theory, really. The large agent's action isn't just more noise. It fundamentally changes that threshold calculation for everyone at the same time. How so? If I see, say, a foreign power announce really strong diplomatic support for the opposition or maybe slap on some heavy sanctions, what does that do to my personal feeling of risk? Does it make me more hesitant or less? It makes you less hesitant. Significantly so. That visible action works like a public signal. It yeah. signals that the current situation, the regime, the bank, whatever it is, might be more vulnerable than people thought. So when the large agent acts, attacks, intervenes, maybe even just withdraws, support their observable move, shifts the private thresholds of all the small agents down. Ah, okay. So my personal requirement for certainty drops. Yeah. I need like less internal conviction, a weaker private signal to decide, okay, now's the time to act. Precisely. The large agent's move basically validates the underlying fear or hope that change is possible, that the status quo is fragile. And the bigger the large agent, the stronger the signal. Exactly. The math shows the size of that threshold shift is directly tied to the large agent's visibility and influence, their lambda. Yeah. A really big visible move has a huge immediate impact. Think about foreign interference scenarios. Say, a major power announces targeted sanctions against leaders of a country or publicly backs an opposition movement like we saw with Ukraine back in 2014. That's a massive public signal. It instantly changes how citizens perceive the regime's strength. It makes it look weaker, more isolated, and that immediately lowers the cost or risk of coordinating action against it. The fear of being the only one acting just plummets across the board. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The large agent doesn't need to touch everyone directly. They just provide that really clear, undeniable signal that things are shaky. They light the fuse by lowering that initial barrier. Okay, but that explains how maybe one person or one neighborhood gets started. How does that initial spark turn into a wildfire? How does a protest in one city or withdrawals at one bank branch go national? That has to involve the network, right? Absolutely. That's where network effects come in and where the math gives us a really clear test. It's called the spectral cascade condition. Essentially, the entire system tips into a full-blown cascade if a specific condition is met. It's a product of two factors exceeding the number one. Okay, let's break that down. No complex formulas, just the core ideas. What are those two factors? The first is network density. Think of this as how tightly connected the underlying social network is. How easily can information and influence spread? So, like... 
dense urban areas versus isolated rural villages or maybe a really active online community versus one that's not. Exactly. Dense network cities, strong social media links, they have higher network density. Information and influence travels fast, makes cascades easier. If your network is fragmented, low density, the spark likely fizzles out locally. High density, like Hong Kong or maybe financial Twitter, means a higher chance of spread. Got it. So network structure is the first piece. What's the second? The second is local complementarity. This sounds a bit technical, but it's basically how much my neighbor's action influences my decision. Is there a strong keeping up with the Joneses effect, but for protesting or bank runs? And why would my neighbor influence me more or less? It's heavily driven by the perceived costs of acting. If joining in seems incredibly costly, you know, certain arrest, losing your life savings, then even if my neighbor acts, I might still hang back. My calculation says it's too risky. But if the costs seem lower, maybe the government seems hesitant or deposit insurance looks shaky, then my neighbor acting suddenly becomes a really strong signal for me. It makes me much more likely to join in. That boosts local complementarity. So low costs mean my neighbor's actions matter more to me. High costs mean they matter less. <laughs> You've got it. Yeah. So the big test is this. Multiply the network density by the local complementarity. If that number is greater than one, the system is unstable. It tips. The cascade escapes that initial point and spreads, often growing exponentially along the most connected paths in the network. If the number is less than one, the action stays contained. It doesn't reach critical mass. Wow. Okay, that's a really clear, almost quantifiable way to think about system fragility. So regulators or analysts could actually try to measure this. In principle, yes. It gives you a target. But hang on, different people react differently, right? Yeah. In a bank run, it's often the big, sophisticated investors who pull out first, not the small savers. How do the model account for who moves when? Great question. The model incorporates different levels of risk aversion. It uses something called ERA utility, but the bottom line is simple. People have different appetites for risk, and it predicts that groups will participate sequentially in order of increasing risk aversion. Those who have less to lose or are more comfortable with risk, they go first. But doesn't that seem a bit orderly? What about pure panic? You know, like a fire in a theater, people don't check their risk tolerance. They just run if they're near the exit. That's a fair point. This model is more about the strategic decision to initiate or join early, not necessarily the chaotic stampede that might follow much later. The initial moves, the ones that start the cascade, tend to follow this risk logic. The first ones over the wall, so to speak, are those whose personal threshold was already lowest because they had less at stake in keeping things as they are. So the prediction, which the sources call Proposition 1, is pretty clear. Your first movers have low risk aversion. In politics, maybe students, the unemployed, marginalized groups, those with less invested in the current system. In finance, it's your hedge funds, your professional traders, those who might even profit from volatility. Their participation threshold is lowest. Okay, that makes sense. And the last movers, the ones who only jump in when it feels safe. Those are the high-risk aversion groups, people with a lot to lose. Think state employees, tenured professors, middle-class homeowners in a political context. Or in banking, it's the average person, the retail saver, trusting their deposit insurance. They need a really high probability of success before they'll risk it. Exactly. They need to see almost everyone else moving before they join. And knowing this sequence is actually a really valuable early warning sign. Right. So if you're a regulator and you suddenly see a spike in withdrawals from hedge funds or institutional accounts, even if the public seems calm, mm. that's your signal. The system might be getting close to that tipping point. Precisely. The framework is very much designed as a defensive tool. And that's important. It's not a playbook for causing chaos, but for understanding fragility. Absolutely. The whole point is resilience testing, developing early warnings for, ideally, democratic governments and financial regulators. It's about spotting vulnerabilities before they break the system. So institutions could actually monitor this. Yeah. Calculate a kind of cascade risk index based on that network density times local complementarity product. That's the idea. If that combined metric starts creeping up towards one, you know, alarm bells should be ringing. Vulnerability is increasing. And thinking defensively, that role of the large agent is critical. You mentioned the military earlier. A defection inside the system seems incredibly dangerous. It's one of the most potent signals. When a major internal player, like 
the armed forces, visibly switches allegiance or even just refuses to act against the population. That's huge. We've seen that historically, haven't we? Definitely. Think about Tunisia in 2011. A key moment wasn't just the protests, but the military's observable refusal to fire on those protesters. Uh, so the large agent signal was in inaction. Exactly. The military, as this crucial domestic large agent, effectively signaled it was no longer fully backing the regime. That single act, or rather inaction, dramatically lowered the perceived risk for ordinary citizens. Suddenly, the fear of a brutal crackdown diminished. It lowered the participation threshold for millions, and that helped trigger the full-scale national cascade that followed. The signal validated the possibility of change. That really underscores the defensive strategy point. It's not just about managing protests or information. It's fundamentally about maintaining the loyalty and alignment of those key internal large agents. It really is. And the model points towards specific policy levers governments or institutions could use to enhance stability, primarily by trying to reduce either that network density or the local complementarity. Okay, let's take local complementarity first. How can you make my neighbor's actions less influential on my own decision? Well, you address the reasons people might want to act in the first place. You lower the perceived benefit or increase the perceived cost of joining a destabilizing action. Like economic measures. Exactly. Offering economic concessions, think wage increases, subsidies, better social safety nets can reduce the underlying grievances that fuel unrest. If people feel their situation is improving or that the government is responsive, the incentive to join a risky protest goes down. Lower incentive means lower strategic complementarity with your neighbors. So good economic policy is stability policy in a very direct way here. Yeah. What about the other side? Managing the information space. We know misinformation is a huge factor now. It's critical. Yeah. Misinformation and propaganda can act like artificial signals. They can artificially inflate people's sense of certainty or perception of the regime's weakness, even if the underlying structural conditions that density times complementarity product are still below the critical threshold of one. So fake news can actually push the system over the edge. The model suggests it can by manipulating those perceived thresholds. So effective communication hygiene, countering disinformation, promoting media literacy, ensuring credible information sources that becomes a core pillar of stability. It stops the thresholds from being artificially lowered by bad actors. And of course, circling back, maintain the loyalty of your key large agents. If the military, major banks, or other crucial institutions remain visibly aligned with stability, the system can absorb a lot more stress from the smaller agents without tipping. It's a really comprehensive picture, so recapping the key takeaways. Visible actions by large agents are powerful signals that shift everyone else's willingness to participate. Then, whether that initial action spreads depends on this critical condition. Network density times local complementarity needing to be greater than one. Right. And we also saw that participation tends to happen in waves, starting with the least risk-averse groups and moving to the most risk-averse. It provides a powerful lens for understanding crises. Indeed. And while the math offers this kind of precision, it's crucial to remember the ethical application. This is fundamentally about strengthening resilience, preventing crises where possible, stress testing our vital systems, not about finding ways to break them. And you had one final, really provocative thought for regulators building on this framework something you called socio-prudential supervision. Yeah, it's an extension of the idea. Traditionally, bank regulators look at things like capital ratios, interbank lending risks between financial institutions. But this model suggests maybe they should also be looking at the social network among depositors. Could we actually monitor the network density and local complementarity within the depositor base itself? Wow, like mapping social media connections or community ties among savers. Potentially, yes, while respecting privacy, of course. The idea would be to get an early warning if the conditions for social contagion, a bank run driven by peer influence and network effects, are starting to build. If that socioprudential risk metric approaches one, maybe regulators could deploy targeted communication strategies or preemptive circuit breakers before social panic takes hold, not just waiting for the traditional financial contagion metrics to flash red. It's thinking about systemic risk in a networked society. A fascinating and perhaps slightly unsettling glimpse into the future of risk management. Thanks for breaking that down for us. My pleasure. It's complex, but the core ideas are quite intuitive once you unpack them.